everyone, welcome to another episode of Keto Chat. I am your host, Carol Freeman, and I'm so excited today. I'm here with Joan Ifland. I didn't check to make sure I'm saying it right. It is Ifland. right. All right. You nailed it. Oh my gosh. We went all the way to Florida to meet, and it turns out that we're neighbors here in the Seattle area. So <laughs> welcome. I'm always excited when I get to have a live live person yeah, in my I office. Know. So. Yes, yeah, so it is exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, would you share with our viewers who who you are? Sure. I am a Dr. Joan Ifland. I my doctorate is in addictive nutrition. I have been looking for a way to reliably help people get control of their food f since 1996. When I started, I just gave up sugar and flour, which I feel is like a bridge keto mm. food plan. Mm -hmm. So it's not all the way keto, but um, it, I got a lot of results from doing just that. And certainly compared to mainstream America, it is a low carb food plan, at least. <laughs> at least it's a low yeah. carb food plan. So many good things happened to me that I wrote a popular book about my family's first three years. I, I did handouts. I had one-on-one -on -one peer consulting uh, practice. I got on TV. I wanted everyone to know how incredible it is when you get off of processed foods. And, um, you know, I didn't make a dent, obviously. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to get my doctorate. I have an MBA from Stanford. I went to a school for new fields to get my doctorate. I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to reach doctors if I get a doctorate, if I can be an academic. So I did that, and then I wrote papers, I wrote chapters for other books, and then finally CRC Press came along and said, would you write a textbook for us? So I wrote the textbook for the field based on my experience and all that good research. And um, based on the textbook, what I learned is that this is a very, very serious addiction. Mm. It's not a garden variety addiction. It has a lot of different substances and it starts at conception, really. Mm. And it just never lets up. We have, we're bombarded with queuing for it. And so, so now I realize that people might need at least the opportunity to get into a video chat a couple of times a day and a conference call. So we tested that out last year. It was shocking. You know, after 23 years, I finally have a system that if somebody is struggling, you know, they, they just like they get on the keto food plan, but they're, the cravings are still calling them and they get on the craving food plan, a keto food plan, but uh, they realize that they've been using food to manage feelings and now they don't know what to do with their feelings uh, or that they have to reorder all their relationships mm. because everybody else is eating processed foods. Yeah. Then, um, then a group of people who are doing the same thing, going through the same thing, who really understand that can be a game changer. Yeah. Yeah, in a good way. Well, let's start with the some definitions then. So what is food addiction because there's a lot of people that say well you can't be really addicted to food right. because we have to eat it so let's talk about what what is food addiction okay so food addiction is a misnomer okay it's actually processed food addiction okay so yes there are people who are volume eaters and maybe they would eat uh, you know a whole pile of broccoli that's a different condition that's somebody who's stretching their stomach out to get a serotonin release. Mm, okay. okay. So it looks a lot like food addiction, but it's actually volume eating. Okay. Okay. So you can also, you can be a volume eater and food addicted, but I think volume eating by itself, like if you're volume eating broccoli, that's a different situation. Yeah. <laughs> so, so processed food addiction means that you just take the world of food and you divide it in two. Mm. You take, like for alcoholism, you take the world of beverages and you divide it in two. Okay. You have alcoholic addictive beverages, you have non-alcoholic, non-addictive. So when you do that with food, boom, all of a sudden, it, you realize it's not about food at all. Mm. It's about processed food-like 
addictive substances. Okay. So sugar is not a food. The mm -hmm. body doesn't read sugar as a food. Uh, even flour isn't really mm -hmm. a food. Gluten has, it's very problem problematic. Salt is, yes, it's a food additive. Processed fats, the body doesn't see processed fats like a food or even dairy has a lot of addictive qualities and everyone knows about caffeine. And then there are food additives. There are things we don't even know mm -hmm. are in the food that are, are could be addictive. So once you have that piece of it, so we're talking about substances, broccoli and steak and chicken and fish and all those beautiful vegetables, all those, even the starches, they're over here with food, but sugar, flour, salt, gluten, th those are over here with addictive substances. Then the world opens up. Mm. Yes, we have to have food. No, we don't have to have addictive substances. That's like the difference between fresh air and air that has cigarette smoke mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you just divide the world into two. Then you can make sense of what is happening in the brain. You have these hyperactive craving pathways in the brain of, an, of a person who has, I call it catching, who has caught an addiction. Mm -hmm. You have hyperactive stress pathways. You have the frontal lobe is not working. So the higher level thinking, like memory and decision making, learning, attention span, impulse control, it's not firing. Mm. Because all the blood is going back here to the craving pathway. Mm. And the other thing in the brain of a person who has become addicted, and we never, none of us ever agreed to this, mm. this was done to us mm. by the food industry, is that the mirror neurons will generally be picking up people who are eating processed foods. And the mirror neurons are saying, oh yes, everybody's eating processed foods. You should eat processed mm -hmm. foods too. That's an addiction. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, so uh, so knowledge is not enough is what you're saying. Yeah. And um, I, you know, I work with a lot of people that we have to come to terms with the fact that that this these aren't normal foods, right? And they, they, they start saying to themselves, you know, one of the pitfalls I find is that they feel, well, I just feel so deprived because everybody else can eat those. Yes. Or uh, wh when can I be normal again and eat those like a normal person? Yes. Okay. So I don't. Uh, once people come into it like a video chat community, and I am able to visit with them for hours and hours and hours, it it takes time mm. to really get it deep on the inside that these are not food. Mm. They're worse than cocaine. Mm. You know, rats will choose sugar and saccharin over cocaine and heroin. Mm. So these are addictive substances. They will always hurt us. Yeah. So every cigarette puff we take hurts us. And at some point, people do get it deep on the inside. Oh, every bite really hurts people. Mm. So instead of wanting to copy or emulate other people, we work on transitioning that to feeling empathy for mm. them. Mm. They don't know they're eating this. They don't know. They say, well, I'm fine. But, you know, they might have some depression or irritability or fatigue or brain fog that they accept as normal because they've never not had it. Mm -hmm. But when you get onto a really good keto plan and your brain clears and you know your stomach problems go away, the long list, about mm -hmm. 125 things can go away. Then you kind of start to get a look at, oh wow, maybe I just don't want to eat that. Mm -hmm. And But the, the key thing is to be around people like Carol who are not eating it and get mm -hmm. that eye to eye contact with people who don't eat it because that will quiet down those mirror neurons. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're gonna talk about, oh my gosh, that was one of the biggest things that I learned from you at your talk, because frankly, when I heard you were speaking in Florida, I was like, this is my favorite topic. It's so underappreciated. Um, and you know, the, you know, how, how, you know, these food-like substances and how they yeah. act in our brain. Yeah. And people are so in denial because we've been conditioned to think that well, it's just empty calories. Like that's the worst that it is. It's oh, just yeah. empty calories, yeah. and 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 so on. So we're gonna get into the mirror neurons in a minute because that that actually was like a really big like light bulb for me. Uh -huh. um, but I want to ask. So we have a question 
uh, from uh, a viewer that will be watching, uh, Tyler uh, Cartwright of Keto Games. He wrote in and uh, he wanted to ask you a question. So he bought your, your textbook. And so his question was, you know, wh what do you say to people? So, so um, in looking at food addiction or addiction like um, addiction behaviors, we look at the brain. Like you can yes. look at MRIs of the yes. brain yes. and see what areas of the light that light up. Yes. And he's asking, you know, what do you say to people that say, well, these things can't be addictive because it's the same part of the brain that lights up when we look at babies or puppies. Oh, that's such a good or, question. Or when we pet cats. Yes, Tyler, <laughs> good question. <laughs> so we, the dopamine, serotonin, endorphin, endocannabinoid, opiate pathways are there for lovely reasons. They were given to us so that we could experience pleasure. Those are the pleasure centers in the brain. And when we're experiencing satisfaction or a sense of good or joy, it's because those pathways are releasing mm -hmm. those neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. So we really love those pathways. Mm -hmm. Now, what an addictive substance does is it hyperactivates. Mm -hmm. So you don't get this nice trickle. You know, like if you exercise in the morning, you're going to feel good all day. If you meditate in the morning, you're going to feel better all day. If you have a really fun conversation with somebody, you're going to feel better for hours. An addictive substance is going to just lift you up in a tsunami, mm. like a, a tidal wave of euphoria, elation. He was just talking to you too. <laughs> and then, uh, and then drop you off. Okay. Yeah. So the trajectory of a baby or a cat is like, oh, but the trajectory of an addictive substance is wham, bam. Yeah. And that's not something that shows in an MRI because the MRI just shows it's lit up, but not the degree. Not, or yeah, the, you, yeah, yeah, because you can't literally watch a, an MRI over time. But I think if you're really interested, you can email me at Food Addiction Reset at gmail.com and I'll find the study. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. very different pattern of release and therefore a very different life. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you're crashing 20 minutes later, you you want, you got to get back up. Right. Get right. Back up. So it's driving you all the time. I mean, it's never yeah. the same high that it was the, the no, first time. So you, no. yeah. yeah, it's nasty. Um, okay. So let's talk about the, the mirror neurons, the big light bulb you had. So you've been yeah. doing this work for over 20 years. Yeah. And the one thing that people struggle with the most is how do I stick with it? Like, how yeah. do I, I know that stuff makes me feel like garbage and this way of eating makes me feel really good. Like, why is it so hard to stick with this? Yes, yes, this is this is the core question. So, let's talk about mirror neurons. Um, mirror neurons do one thing and they do it extremely well, which is they tell us to copy and, and copy urgently, copy what the people around us are doing. And why is this so powerful? Well, because 200,000 years ago, when, uh, when people were in tribes, primitive tribes, life was very dangerous. Mm. You know, so if a predator came along and that person on the other side of the tribe realized it and knew that everybody needed to run like this, they would start running. You would just start running. You wouldn't stop and engage higher level thinking and say, wow, do I feel like running? <laughs> is this a running moment for me? No, because if you did that, the predator would get you. You would be the straggler and the predator would get you. And you would not live long enough to have children and send on your genes. Same thing with the weather or with food. If you just like say, oh, I don't feel like looking for food today. I see everybody's leaving to look for food. I don't feel like it. Another You're going to die. <laughs> other animals have these, right? So it's like, I keep, I keep referring it to as the lemming effect, like the little animals that run over the cliff, or it's a, what allows birds to fly together. Yes, flocks yeah. of birds. Or when the wolves get up and they go, honey, everybody goes. Mm -hmm. The whole group of wolves go. Um, so yes, this is really, this is a lot of different behaviors are uh, based in these mirror neurons. They're quite powerful. Mm -hmm. So when a mirror neuron is activated, the way it communicates with me, so if I see somebody lifting their hand like this, my mirror neurons actually will go directly to my motor neurons mm -hmm. and they will send impulses to my hand. 
So I, my hand's not moving, but it's receiving the same impulses as the hand that I'm watching move. Mm. Okay, now we know that the reason why addictions can be transmitted through people mm. is that the mirror neurons are capable also of sending messages directly to the craving pathways. Mm. So if I'm watching somebody eat a processed food, I am actually in relapse. Mm. My neurons, my craving neurons are actually activated, not at the same level, mm. at about a 20% level. But I have that experience of kind of an echoing of a, of a relapse. So what I realize, and yet, if you're not in a tribe, you're unhappy, <laughs> right? Yeah. So if you're outside of a tribe and you're alone, mm -hmm. your mirror neurons are just going berserk mm -hmm. because your mirror neurons are saying, okay, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, you're gonna die, something's gonna get us, but, and we need to be in a tribe and we need to go look for a tribe right now. So all of our time is gonna be spent looking for a tribe. So basically you're describing like the woman who's at home trying to follow a diet all by herself and the yes. rest of her family is eating all the processed foods. Well, and she's yeah. seeing it on TV. Yes, okay. So mm -hmm. this is why when you see TV commercials for snack foods, they're always people, mm. right? Mm. And they're always on the mm. sofa. And so it doesn't have to be in the same room. You can see other people in movies, yes. TV, and commercials doing it, and it will yes. activate it. Yes, yes. And, and particularly if you've ever sat on a sofa and watched mm. TV, mm -hmm. your mirror neurons are going to identify more strongly mm. because it's something that you've experienced yourself over and over again. It's like, yeah. So as you're watching right now, you're having a very strong desire to pet a cat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Mm. So I realized that I needed to provide people with a tribe. And it's just what you're saying. It works over video. Mm. It works on a screen. Mirror neurons will engage. Mm. So we started the Addiction Reset community last year. We beta tested it in 2018. And it worked. It worked incredibly. I mean, I've been looking for 23 years mm. for something that would be reliable. Well, and 23 years ago, you didn't have the technology that you could set that up remotely. No. You'd all have to move no. in together. <laughs> no, and, and so because it's such a bad addiction, we need a lot of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we need a lot of counteracting messaging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, I mean, I realize we, we, offer, we offer two video chats and then a, a telephone conference call in the evening. And then we offer a lot of things in between. Mm. Like we record the conference calls. We have a whole big archive of mm. conference calls. And people can listen to conference calls in between the video chats. Mm. And people do uh, very often need to do that. Mm. You know, if they're lapsing and lapsing and lapsing and they just cannot get on top of it, they just need to kind of soak their environment yeah. and their heads in uh, recovery stimulation mm. so that that part of the brain starts sending out bigger thoughts than the craving part. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So does it get easier over time or? Well, here's the thing is that mirror neurons are always going to be working. Mm. So and the, until you get to the, and this is really what saved me mm. in 1996, was my family got on board with me right mm. away. I was not a TV watcher, mm. so I wasn't getting that stimulation. I had a once a week physical group. Mm. So I had a tribe to mm. identify with. Okay, this is my new tribe. Even though I was only with them once a week, my experience was so tremendous that I was talking to them in my head even mm. when I wasn't mm. with them, okay. you know? Like I was it, it I now know and I was not a shopper. I wasn't the kind of person who would go and just drift around the mall. I, I wouldn't drift around grocery stores. I was like, okay, I got 20 minutes to do the grocery shopping for four people for the week. Okay, I'm in, I'm out. So I had a, I didn't know that I was avoiding a lot of food stimulation, mm. a lot of cueing, yeah. a lot of kind of mirror neuron provocation, mm. if you will. So, mm -hmm. uh, and I started writing a book about okay. it right away. So I was also processing things through writing. Mm. I had therapeutic things going on, which I, I wouldn't have I've identified at that time, but now what, looking back on it, I'd say, oh, well, that's why uh. I was able to do it. But I will tell you something interesting. I did that for eight years, and then I went back to get my doctorate, and I said, well, I, I really don't have time to go to the meetings anymore. Mm. Do you know it took uh, 10 years 
But at the end of 10 years, my program had completely fallen apart. Mm. My dad died, mm. and I couldn't stop. Mm. I couldn't stop. There was mm. a particular suite that he liked. I remember at all of his services and so on, this suite was everywhere. Mm. Everybody brought their own versions of it. Mm. I could not stop. Mm. And then I got back into a group, okay. and I stopped right away. Okay. Yeah. So you find your tribe and community. And I often tell people that's part of why... You know whatever dietary regimen people follow if they identify like a vegan movement right like yes. people identify i'm a vegan they hang out with the vegans they yes. go to vegan restaurants yes that's part of why it's sustainable for them is yes because they immerse themselves in that tribe that's a and perfect analogy or kosher mm -hmm. or a pescatarian mm -hmm. or whatever or yeah if you if you raise a kosher child uh, the first thing they do when they get in front of a buffet is they turn to their parents and they want to know what they can't eat. Mm -hmm. They don't just run over and sneak the, mm -hmm. you know, the non-kosher foods. Yeah. No, the, the, their tribe identity is, oh, we're kosher. Yeah. Or, oh, we're vegan. Yeah. What, I, what can I eat, mom? What What do you say to? So I work with a lot of, almost all women, and um, a lot of them still. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to deprive my kids. Like. So it's much easier. My household is all keto. Like I don't have those those things that trigger me here or yeah. cue me to eat them. Yeah. Um, and it's so much easier to not want those things if yeah. they're not the house. Yeah. But most of the people I'm working with, they still have the the you know the perspective that well you know I don't want to deprive my children of these foods and you know my husband I don't want to you know inconvenience my husband and make him have to eat these you know clean out the house of all these things. So. Yeah. What, what do you what do you say when that's their big well um, so uh, education education really helps we do have handouts about processed foods at uh, food addiction resources click on handouts and then scroll down and you'll just see like 25 really well documented handouts so the, one of the first ones is the list of diseases associated mm. with processed foods. Mm. And that's something that you can just like really subtly put up on the refrigerator yeah. door, yeah. right? Um, and But the most important thing that really, the secret weapon is their mirror neurons. Mm. So as, you know, as usually women are the, the food provider in the mm. household, not always, um, but they will start making clean food. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna get that crock pot out, why? Because it will fill the house up mm. with clean food cues. Mm. So smells are the strongest cue and mm. uh, you just fill the house up with clean food cues. Mm. And just as Carol was saying, if the primitive brain knows that a calorie is available, it will bug you to mm -hmm. go get it. Mm -hmm. So if you are in, in a primitive situation mm -hmm. and you walk past the place where the whatever is growing and your brain will remember that it was there last year, mm -hmm. it'll make you stop. It will say stop, 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 go get it, go get it, go get it. Your brain will suddenly be flooded with thoughts of that food. Oh yeah, that food is here at this time of year. Of course I'm going to go get it. So the primitive brain is very tuned in to what is available. And if there is processed food, particularly addictive foods in the household, everybody's brain will be aware of that and everybody's brain will be saying, go get it, go get it, go get it. Vending machines at work, break rooms mm -hmm. at work, somebody sends around that dang email that such and such is in the break room. You're, it just drives people crazy. Mm -hmm. It really feeds the obsession. So another thing to do is be very careful about what is out on the kitchen counter. If there is clean food on the kitchen counter, then everybody is being visually triggered into, oh, that's what's available. And then you gotta negotiate with your family members that anything, like not the children, the children are just not allowed to have it in the house. But the other adults, they gotta keep it in the trunk of their mm -hmm. car and they gotta make sure that their keys are not available to you. So I realized that we're going, I forgot to set this up, that we, our goal today was to give you the top five ways to overcome a food addiction. You've hit on two of them already. Yeah, <laughs> don't keep it in your so, house. Yeah, so don't keep it in your house. Uh, set out the crock pot, like mm -hmm. have, have 
uh, clean food cues, keto f- food cues, put yeah. those things, make them more available. Yeah. Um, all right, let's keep going. Okay. <laughs> so the biggest, biggest, biggest one is never to look at somebody while they're eating an mm. addicted food. Mm. Uh, that is, that will just, that just drives those mirror neurons into a frenzy. Mm. And then you're, th- and they can reach the motor neurons directly. Remember, this is, some people have had this where their hand is reaching out to get something mm-hmm. and their brain, their frontal lobe is saying, no, I don't want that. But the hand gets it and puts it in the mouth anyway. Mm. That's mirror neuron triggering mm-hmm. in, in combination with cravings. So the next thing is to have the correct foods available a lot. The, and then another one is to get an online grocery store ordering system mm-hmm. going because the grocery store is just a massive trigger it's engineered mm. by food neuromarketers to be massively overwhelming mm. and it's tragically effective. Mm. So watch your environments. You know, don't go to restaurants. The food in your house is so much better. It's safe. You don't really know what's in that restaurant food, no matter what they say about it. So get into a beautiful habit of eating at home. And then with your friends, family, if you need an activity, go for a walk. Go to the library. Do something that doesn't involve food. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The, the, I always I teach my clients to think about it as like avoid sensory input of foods that you don't want to eat, right? Excellent. So don't, don't Excellent. look at foods. Like don't spend all day on Pinterest looking up yes. food recipes and yes. food videos. One of the ones that I had to change for me to be able to stay on keto, I used to love to watch cooking shows. Yes. And even now, I'm almost four years in, even now when it pops on if somebody else is watching it like I I'm like I gotta look away because all of a sudden I'm like that sounds really good right now so don't don't look at food don't look at recipes and and um, this is one of the reasons I have people for my structure is is I don't allow them to have any do to implement recipes at all for at least the first 30 days of oh, don't look keto. at a cookbook yeah don't yes. look at cookbooks don't yes. don't uh don't even have recipes so here's how you can keep it so simple that you're yes. not even spending time looking at recipes and yes don't don't smell food right like yes. i've had people say like well the way i cope with my sugar addiction is i just smell it just like you're uh, torturing no. yourself yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's very smart very smart but and, and yeah. there's one and hearing it is less common but there's one and i really like to this so you i noticed that you um the way that you talk about these foods you don't name specific foods so no, that's the other thing no, it's a trigger. i don't allow as yeah. well and people get all bent out of shape about like wow how weak are you that just talking about it but no, no, that's smart. enough it's enough if you name a specific food especially yeah. if it's somebody's past history yeah their brain will just start ruminating oh gosh it. yeah you know our reactivity to food cues is huge mm. I mean that's why we're alive today because yeah. for all of our generations mm-hmm. they were highly sensitive highly reactive to food cues we're not supposed to be able to control that. We are supposed to mm-hmm. respond to that. Mm-hmm. So you're right on target. You gotta deal with the cueing. Yeah. yeah. And we live in an environment, you're giving so many examples of like why processed food addiction is so much harder to overcome mm-hmm. than any other addiction is because mm-hmm. it's everywhere, every corner and every food manufacturer. And the thing that gets me is that this is stuff that every food manufacturer, they know all of this. And most nutritionists oh, and dietitians oh, don't. It. Yeah. Now they, I remember um, I was giving a talk years ago and a scientist came up to me and he said, I just want to affirm you, Joan. This was years ago before we kind of, but now we have a groundswell around food addiction. Years ago, this man came up to me and said, I was the head of research and development for one of the big food processors. He said, we had three scientists whose full-time job was to make the foods addictive mm. so this is this is the tobacco model mm. this is this started when the tobacco companies moved into processed foods in the 1980s and they laid on the advertising and they hyped up the addictive properties of the foods and they went after small children and they made it available everywhere and they made it very very cheap same model as when cigarette smoking took off in the in the 1940s it's mm. very deliberate and unbelievably profitable. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and you, you're not, you're not doing your kids any favor by letting them 
eat those foods when they're young because you're actually just making them addicted from a very young age. Like well, people falsely yeah. think like, well, the kid's skinny, so they can no, get away with it for now. No, I do say this really um, snide thing when people ask me when they could give their children sugar. Mm. I say, just anytime you would give them a cigarette, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Sugar is actually worse that. than cigarettes. Yes. In yeah. a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. It's a slow I, I agree. Yeah. 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 Oh, gosh. Oh, I'm so glad that you're here, and I love everything you've shared. Is there anything else that you were hoping I would ask about or anything else that you want to um, share with people? Well, I, I have a project underway I'd like to get people ready for. I'm writing a book called Could It Be food addiction. Mm. So for people who have tried, most people try 20 or 30 or 40 things. Most people, some people are trying something new every day. They're, they're, I will say people don't give up. Mm, right, no, they right. keep going yeah. and they're determined and they keep trying it. So the answer is maybe all of those other hundreds of things have failed because it's actually a food addiction. Mm. And food addiction needs a very precise comprehensive approach you need to get in the right tribe kind of in the right support group you need a super clean food plan and you need somebody who is going to understand lapsing Mm. because lapsing in alcoholism is one thing you can go the entire day without an alcohol cue you cannot go an entire day without a processed food trigger Mm. Mm. massive triggers people really pushing it on you and now that we understand mirroring, it's inevitable that we, that a food addict will lapse on processed foods. And so people who understand how to pull you back up, be really patient and kind. And then, um, you know, gradually and respectfully bring the household on board. And there, it's a very specific approach. And then, and then access to a lot of support, mm. access to hours and hours a day. So you're not gonna get dressed and go to three meetings a day. But if you're home, yeah, you might like tune in and if you're on the East Coast, 11 o'clock and then tune in again at four o'clock and then get on the phone at eight o'clock. So meetings that are spaced out during the day and that you don't have to get dressed and, and drive to online meetings. It's very specific, but it really works. Yeah. yeah. I thought of one more question for you. Um, is there any hope for somebody to get you know, sober off of processed foods if they don't clean up their home food environment? Yes, oh yes. Okay. So this is, oh thank you, that's a really perceptive question. So think about a typical food addict in the moment. They're exhausted. They're shattered because they've tried all these things, nothing worked. Their self-esteem is non-existent. They have brain fog. They have physical disabilities. Their joints hurt. They may have excess fat tissue on their bodies. They are really beat, and not through their own doing. They've been beaten up. So is that person gonna be able to rearrange all of their relationships and clean out their house and work a new food plan and start thinking differently and feeling differently and be okay? But no, (laughs) it's like completely unrealistic. So where do you start? You just start with getting onto video chats with other people. And we do have another program, which is all day long. Mm. Actually, the video screen is open all day long and people can just sit and first of all, just start to identify with their tribe and mm. let the mirror neurons kick in so that after a while you say, okay, I, I've got some clean food in the refrigerator, I'm gonna have that for lunch. Mm. And then they can go off and have that and come back and sit with us some more. So this online full-time, I call it home rehab, mm. it's the Home Addiction Reset Program, the HARP. So that sometimes is all people can do to start. It might be months before, mm. now you gotta remember also the people in that household First of all, they're probably addicted. Mm. And second of all, they are so tired of this family member. Mm. Oh, I'm starting a new diet today. So Mm. this, in their eyes, this Mm. is just one more diet. Mm. What is mom doing today? Mm. So the idea that you're going to work with all those household members and make them comfortable with having Mm. the processed foods out of the house, that's a fairly complicated process. Mm. Now, if you live alone, like I live alone, 
there's not a molecule of processed foods in my house. But I, I have total control over that. And even that process can take weeks and weeks, and it can be done by degrees. Mm -hmm. Like I remember, I went through and got the obvious stuff out, but I put it in a garbage bag in the pantry. Well, my family could still get it, but the visual was that they were pulling it out of the garbage bag. Mm. And then eventually I moved all that to the garage and then eventually into a garbage can. But that took weeks. Mm. Yeah, we let that play out over time. I let my family members get used to this idea. But they had already seen the results in me. So sometimes people say, all right, I'm going to let my family see the results in me, and then we'll talk about getting the house cleaned out. And sometimes that doesn't work. You know, the person will gradually become more and more motivated because they're really tired of lapsing on the stuff mm -hmm. in the house. Yeah. So they just finally put their foot down and they say, I just can't have this in the house. And then gradually the other family members start feeling better. Do the grades at school come up, mm. and they they become more agreeable to mm. it. It's a process. It's wonderful. It's yeah. a complicated process. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Oh, I thank you so much for being here. Yeah. How so? If people want to know more about you and connect with you and your programs, how can they get in touch with you? Okay, so uh, an email to food addiction reset at gmail. We have a great website foodaddictionreset.com we have a wonderful Facebook group food addiction education so right. yeah you can find us there wonderful yeah I'm gonna go join all those right now yeah <laughs> yes. well thank you again Dr. Iflin for being here I'm thank so excited for, for the work me. that you're doing and yeah. it's so us uh, share this with anyone that you think, well, everyone. Everyone should have this, should watch this video. It's very eye-opening. Yes, yes. Um, but if you enjoyed this, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe. Hit the little bell down there as well. That's how you're going to get notifications of new videos in our uh, Keto Chat series. So uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Bye I now. appreciate it.